Thank you everybody for joining today's uh, special AMA. Um, to kick us off, I'm gonna go right ahead and hand it over to Kathleen Francis, the National President of WISE. Thank you, Gina, and uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the WISE Women Leading uh, in Sports conversation. Uh, we're excited to join the Sports Innovation Lab, um, their Ask Me Anything series, uh, and I want to thank Angela and Gina for, uh, for allowing us to, to partner on this effort. Um, as uh, Gina mentioned, I'm the chair and president of WISE, and for those of you who are not familiar with the organization, uh, it's women in sports and events. Uh, and we are a, a nonprofit volunteer-led organization with um, chapters in 25 cities across the U.S., and we're also in, uh, in Toronto. So I welcome all of you, wherever you're coming from. Um, you know, our mission really is to support the recruitment uh, and advancement of women in the business of sport. Uh, and we do that in a variety of ways. Uh, we do that through networking opportunities. We do that through uh, the local programming that exists in our power plays, our financial fitness, our mentoring efforts, both a one-to-one -one mentoring opportunities as well as speed mentoring. Uh, and we also do it through national events. Our professional development program in the Executive Leadership Institute, which is in partnership with Tuck Executive Education, uh, is a five-day immersive uh, initiative that uh, helps women in the pipeline to advance. Uh, and we also uh, just recently announced the, uh, the new dates for our uh, Wiser Symposium uh, and our prestigious Woman of the Year annual luncheon. Uh, we've sort of looked at this very unprecedented time like all of you are and saying, how do we, yeah. how do we innovate and stay asleep? What we're doing? Uh, we uh, right how do we change uh, and do better? Crying. Uh, well, it's like crying. <laughs> Hi guys, please make sure you're muted. <laughs> Thank you. See, we're innovating as we go along here. Um, you know, we, we just announced, as I mentioned last week, uh, that we were going to uh, postpone our luncheon and symposium that would take place typically next month. Uh, and we recognized that there was an opportunity to think a little differently about how we, uh, and when we do that event. Uh, and we're using this time to innovate and say, Let's do it during Women's History Month. Uh, and so next March, uh, the 15th and 16th, mark your calendars. Uh, we will have our Wiser Symposium that features our Women of the Year uh, luncheon the very next day. Um, things are different and how we deliver and, and offer our programming has changed. Uh, and this is one of those times, uh, right? And the opportunity for us uh, to join forces with uh, Sports Innovation Lab to offer this exciting conversation uh, is made, a bit, made possible really by the partnership uh, with our local chapter. Uh, and Ray, uh, I want to thank you, uh, Ray Cowdor, for bringing it to our attention and opening it up to the rest of your colleagues and, and uh, uh, as part of the shared community. So uh, without further ado, I, I want to uh, introduce uh, Gina Waldhorn. Uh, Gina is the COO of Sports Innovation Lab. Uh, she is, was named in 2017 as uh, one of the 50 most daring uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, she has uh, been formalizing global innovation programs for corporations for a number of years uh, and is now moving into the sports uh, space uh, to help us uh, innovate uh, around our business using the Labs Research and Advisory Council. Uh, so she's also the host of the Ask Me Anything series, uh, and we are excited uh, to have Gina really be a part of this industry. It's, it's fantastic to have women uh, such as yourself here and for the women that you're going to introduce right now. So I'm going to turn it over to you uh, and thank everyone for, for joining today uh, and have at it, Gina. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, and thanks everyone again for joining. So we're gonna go ahead 
um, and get started. As Ke Kathleen mentioned, we started this, the Sports Innovation Lab started this AMA series um, around the beginning of March when really sports went on pause and we all went into lockdown. And we did so because we felt it was critical to keep a conversation going and bring together, together leaders who during a time of crisis um, were focused on action. Um, so that's what we are doing today um, with some incredible female leaders, but we also wanna make sure that you guys get involved. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you how today you can participate in our uh, session. You're on mute, please stay there. Uh, if we need to unmute someone, we will. Uh, please ask questions by typing them in the chat window. If you're unfamiliar with that, I'm gonna show you how you can do that. This session is being recorded. So if you have to jump off or have a friend who missed it, um, we'll go ahead and follow up with that recording. And make sure if you wanna continue the conversation, we have a free open Slack community with professionals. You can join that and we'll follow up with that link as well. So if you wanna ask a question, please just hover over the chat functionality uh, within Zoom. It's gonna open a little window. You can then choose to either post your question to all of the participants where everyone would see it by sending it to everyone, or you can choose to select a, uh, send it to the host privately and it'll just go um, to myself. Um, and then you'll see your question pop up on the screen. We will be moderating these questions um, and then bringing them to our guest. So um, with that, let me go ahead and introduce our esteemed guest. Um, first, we'd love to welcome Marissa Daly, VP and General Manager Media at the Los Angeles Rams. This 2020 season marks Marissa's third season with the LA Rams, serving as the team's VP and General Manager of Media. In this role, Marissa oversees content strategy, production, and distribution across Rams owned and social channels. Before joining the Rams, Daly served as the Senior Director of Product Marketing for Yahoo Sports and led marketing for the sports and fantasy properties, including strategy, research, positioning, CRM, mobile acquisition, creative, media planning, and brand management. Marissa and her husband, Sam, are parents to their sons, Owen and Hudson, and have a golden retriever at home. So thank you so much, Marissa, for joining us today. Um, with Marissa is Sarah Crennan, VP and Head of Content for Yahoo. Sarah is the VP and Head of Content for Yahoo Sports, where she's living her passions for both sports and digital content. Sarah leads the video, editorial, and social teams at Yahoo Sports through shaping their content strategy and partners closely with teams all across Verizon to realize that vision through partnerships, monetization, and technology. She was named to the inaugural, inaugural Crane's Notable Women in the Business of Sports, and Sarah continues to develop innovative ways to match sports storytelling to shifting fan and audience behaviors, um, really reaching that fluid fan. Sarah is a passionate women's lacrosse fan, having played at her alma mater, Georgetown University, and she currently remains active with sport as an on-air analyst for women's lacrosse games, having cover games on CBS, ESPN, and for the NCAA. Um, she was born and raised in Annapolis, and she now resides outside New York City with her husband, Kyle, two sons, Ryan and James, and daughter, Audrey. So we've got, uh, everyone's got a full house who's joining us today. Um, and finally, uh, CEO and co-founder of the Sports Innovation Lab, Angela Ruggiero. Angela is a global sports leader, advocate, entrepreneur, author, investor, and speaker, as well as being CEO of the Sports Innovation Lab, um, which if you're not familiar, is a technology-powered market research firm empowering industry-leading sports brands to create breakthrough fan experiences. Um, Angela is also a four-time Olympian and gold medalist in ice hockey for Team USA, as well as the first female non-goalie to play in a men's professional hockey league. Angela is a distinguished US OCPC and International Olympic Committee member and executive board member for almost a decade and served as the chief strategy officer for the successful Los Angeles bid to host the 2028 Olympics. She's been named a Sports Business Journal's 40 Under 40, Forbes Top 25 Most Powerful Women in Sport, and currently serves on some of the pow most powerful boards in all of sports, including the International Olympic Committee's Digital and Technology Commission. She's a graduate of the Harvard College and Harvard Business School, where she got her MBA, as well as earning a master's degree in education from the U University of Minnesota. So thank you and welcome, Angela, Sarah, and Marissa. Um, to get us started, Angela's gonna have a conversation with our two guests before we turn it over to questions. But as that conversation is taking place, 
Don't hesitate to stop popping your questions for our guests into the chat window. So Angela, thank you so much for coming out of maternity leave for us uh, today to host this uh, beginning of our conversation. Thanks, Gina. Um, you rock, our CEO, everyone give a thumbs up. Um, uh, and I wanna thank Kathleen and all of WISE as well for, uh, for partnering on this um, AMA series. We obviously have been opening it up to the global sports community and having women obviously um, as a leader of a uh, sports technology research company, um, having more women at the table and, and coming together to learn from one another is a massive priority of mine and our company. So it's a, it's a huge honor to be able to do this with WISE. So thanks Kathleen and, and all the chapters out there. Um, so I'm really excited for this conversation. Uh, Sarah and Marissa promised me before the call, they're gonna be real, they're gonna tell you how it is, how it isn't, and how they're managing uh, to do amazing things uh, uh, given the context of uh, the environment. So just to dive right in, you heard their bios, super impressive. Um, I wanna start, uh, I'll start with Sarah. Just tell us a little bit about your role, um, your organization, and um, what's motivating you to get into sports specifically, just a little bit of background. Sure. Um, so first of all, sorry for the background noise. Neighbors, landscapers are here. So here we go. All uh, background noise is allowed, by the way. I don't know if you saw the cameo by my three month old. So we all have something going on at home. That's part of this conversation. So it's yeah, all these good. landscapers have impeccable timing, everything important I've had to do, they show up for. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I work at Verizon Media. It's the media arm under Verizon. And um, it is really a, com a combined entity of, of Yahoo assets and AOL assets that were brought together um, and created this broader media organization. And I work specifically across Yahoo Sports and Yahoo Fantasy. Um, and now we're venturing into betting. So what that means is I oversee a team of content creators and, uh, and storytellers spanning video editorial social and audio. Um, I always wanted to wind up in sports. I feel very fortunate that I did. I did not have a clear path to doing so. I was a government major under in undergrad and um, kind of bumped around until I found my way to Yahoo Sports. And I'm, you know, very grateful for that. I've been working in media for 10 years now. Um, and yeah, continue to be challenged every day by truly the way, um, the way audience is shifting, the way new consumers are challenging us and the way fandom is evolving. Uh, one of my quarantine goals has been to get good at TikTok, like many people out there. And I haven't gotten there yet, but I'm always motivated by the idea of a new creative tool set. Um, and, and, you know, one of the things we've, we've been playing with is our AR and VR technology. And so that's been pretty cool, but um, I mostly just feel lucky to be here and I'm excited for this conversation. Great, so Sarah's um, super smart, builds technology, obviously with Yahoo Sports is, we'll get into all the different ways that you're using tech to help uh, the sports community. On the flip side, um, Marissa is the sports community. You're with a team leveraging tech more than you know digital um all the innovations out there with the rams uh tell us a bit about your role there and uh and what helped you get into sports as well yeah so um sarah and i were colleagues back in the day when i was at yahoo uh and she's amazing uh, and now i have a very similar role so i actually you know was heavily in marketing at yahoo sports and now i'm heavily into media and uh, you know, oversee our content production business. So everything you see on all of our owned platforms, so our app, our site, and social media will run through our team. We operate as a media business, but we also operate as like an internal agency to, to you know, think about how to ticketing guide, sort of anything that you need from the organization from a content side comes from us. And I got, I was a finance major undergrad, so similar to Sarah, I was not, I didn't, I wasn't in undergrad thinking I was gonna work in sports through the financial crisis of 09, really felt like if I was gonna work this hard, I might as well be in an industry that like gets my blood going and gets me excited. And so went to business school with the intention of working in sports and made that, made successfully made that transition happen. Um, and was at Yahoo for seven years before jumping over to the Rams. Cool, thank you. So a little bit more context then. Um, we'll stay with you, Marissa. Um, 
given obviously COVID and the situation we're all working from home now, um, how have your responsibilities or initiatives shifted in the last few weeks? Um, I know obviously you had to unveil your logo and your branding, all digital. Um, has your role changed? Like how are you, what has shifted uh, uh, over the last few weeks? Yeah, a lot. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, more now more than ever, people are looking for a way to engage with the teams and the players and everything they like so much. And with, with, with no live sports on television, right? We're left thinking about how to kind of authentically connect with people who are looking for things. And yes, we had to launch our brand digitally, which changed very quickly. And I think you saw the NFL made such a good example of the draft. Like the draft was, I think, a really good example of how we've leveraged technology. We've leveraged all these tools in our toolbox. And it, and it was like nice to see these young guys at home with their families and all the teams kind of jump in and how they interacted with fans. And, and so it's learning how to use Zoom really well, right? I, I think learning how to, um, what is old is new again? How do we leverage old, you know, older footage? How do we reinvent the wheel? How do we work with players, right? At some point, maybe, maybe there's too many at home workouts. Maybe there's too many of this, but like we're continuing to try to find ways to be innovative in production, be innovative in storytelling. And, and I think one, it's bringing a level of entertainment to fans, but also bringing a level of reality that like we're all going through this together. Mm -hmm. um, and it's hard. It's hard for yeah. players. It's hard for us. It's, it's hard. It doesn't, doesn't matter who you are. This is hard. Yeah, no, I hear you. Um, one thing you mentioned um, at Sports Innovation Lab, we have this term called fluid fan, where fans are essentially more fickle than they used to be. They demand more. We believe technology is the way that we're, you know, you can get more of that engagement. Um, and so we love uh, the fact that you gave a shout out to the tech platform, the NFL draft. I'm going to throw it back to Sarah. How has your world changed? You obviously were able to leverage um, the, your platform to get the draft out there to allow fans to stay engaged at a time where, um, you know, we don't have much to, to watch on TV. And this was something, um, obviously, through your broadcast um, and your, your digital platform, fans could do that. So how's your world shifted? And maybe you can give a shout out to, to what you did there. Sure. So we don't have sports scores. We don't have sports highlights. We don't have live games. And that's really what's fueled our business and coverage um, for every year, for every single month, for every single day. And, uh, and absent of those things, that core utility, that uh, fan interest, it really puts a lot of pressure on my team to come up with ways to engage. So we've launched, um, we've launched a, a new podcast. We've launched a new video series. Uh, we focused actually right out of the gate. We did an event with the Women's Sports Foundation, and it was We Keep Playing with Billie Jean King behind it. And um, I'm actually incredibly proud of what we did because I think the gr there's so much trepidation and anxiety that's come from this time. And what we had hoped to do was allow young athletes to see other athletes and how they're responding to the crisis with their training, um, with their mental health. Uh, and I'll be completely honest and, and say that a lot of athletes declined participating in the event because of their mental health and because they were still trying to kind of place how to handle the severity. Um, of what was going on, but you know that kind of re-emphasized for me the importance of the conversation. And so over the next several weeks, we're expecting to do more of that and to really use our platform for some of that live conversation and engagement. And then, you know, when I look at um, sports across the board, they're an outlet for for people. It's the best part of, of their day. It's their point of connection for their friends and family. And so we want to continue to offer that, doing you know fun things, whether it's covering the last dance or having debates over a sports movie. You know what's the best sports movie? We actually did a Sandlot versus Major League, which was fun. Um, when I look at the top performing articles, very few of them have to do with coronavirus. The in the top ten for the last week, the majority of our content was about. Michael Jordan and Isaiah Thomas. And so, you know, looking at those user cues, looking at those reader cues, our engagement to say, okay, people want an outlet. They want to remember what they love about sports. Um, 
and they want to feel like they can do something that they enjoy during this this time and that's why they're coming to us as a brand mm -hmm. Well, I love uh, the hashtag we keep playing with the Women's Sports Foundation. I was the president there for a couple of years, actually. And Billie Jean, the fact that you're getting that message out and communicating, it's just like what we're doing today. You cr created a platform that allowed athletes to learn from one another and feel, uh, you know, that, that they're okay. Um, that's what this, I think, uh, AMA is all about as well. So Sarah or Marissa, um, a question we got from Stephanie Jacobson, who's a corporate strategy or corporate sponsorship for the Philadelphia Flyers. Um, she had a question about, um, we've all been able to have quote unquote balance where you can leave home, go to work, almost compartmentalize, maybe leave the kids at home, leave sort of some of the, all the other obligations that you have and then come back home and you know, that other portion of yourself is there. Now it's mixed. I mean, we have kids in the background, neighbors, all kinds of responsibilities, and it's blurred. Um, so her question is, now that there are no boundaries and it's difficult to navigate, um, uh, you know, do you have any recommendations or advice? I mean, I guess I would say, don't be too hard on yourself, right? This sucks. Like, you want me to be real? This blows, <laughs> right? <really> like, <laughs> I was on a Zoom call the other day, and my kid was walking around naked and pooped next to me on the floor, right? <laughs> and I'm on a call, and I'm like, um, sorry, I have to clean up poop. Like, that's not normal, right? It's just, it's, there's nothing about it that's normal. Um, but I think it's like finding moments, right? Like, I've tried between, like, five and seven to like be a mom. I try to put my phone down and put the ringer on. So like if someone needs me, they can call me or text me and I'll like walk by and check it. But those are sort of like some sacred times of like, okay, it's dinner, it's bath, it's story time. Um, and I try, try, try. It doesn't mean it's perfect, right? And in the beginning, I thought I was sick and I was like having chest pains and called the doctor and he's like, it's called a panic attack, right? So like I downloaded Calm, which has like really been helping. I'm not on it as much as I should be, but those sorts of things. And I you know, walking the dog, getting outside with the family, like throwing the ball. Like I have a Peloton and one should think I would use it every day. I don't, but like occasionally doing those things. I just think like finding that moment to be sacred, whether it's with your family, whether it's watching TV, like if you have kids, don't have kids, single married. Again, this sucks and it's hard. So it's just like finding those moments. But I mean, I think that's like the constant stress. It's like, don't be, beat yourself up about it. I feel like a bad worker and a bad mom every day. Do you question then to follow up on that? Because yeah. Um, I get it. My kids are watching TV now and I'm like, my three-year-old, I'm like, oh my God, I'm a bad mom, but you, you can't put that pressure. Mm -hmm. um, on the work side, um, because if you can't give yourself fully, if you're, you know, obviously we're working remotely, we can't sit and whiteboard or have meetings face-to-face. -face, like, yeah. um, and, and well, this is why. So, um, you know, is there, is there the same sort of pressure being a woman versus a man? Is there any gendered differences that you're seeing, Marissa, or do you think it's across the board, we're all in it, uh, you know, trying to figure it out together? I mean, I think we're all in it. I mean, I'm lucky. I have a super awesome husband who does a lot of, does a lot of like home responsibilities. And I work with, I work with a lot of people at the Rams who are parents. And so I think that like from the parent side of it and like juggling the kids at home, people get it. Um, and we just try to be respectful. Like someone, you know, was like, hey, I'd really like to meet with you at two o'clock because that's when my kids are sleeping. Can you make it work? And you're like, yeah, okay. Like, I think the honesty helps because like not, no one wants to say or hear like, everything's fine. I'm great. I'm handling this well. Yeah. You're not. I mean, great. Good for you. Just throw me some of that. But like we're trying to work around other people's schedule and like my team knows that sometimes it's hard and we do calls, you know, at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. or like jumping on the call at all different hours to like make it work for people's schedule because yeah. 10 to when kids are asleep, you you have to be free yeah. again. So honesty, I love that as a piece of advice. Um, uh, Sarah, do you have any thoughts on this question as well? Well, first of all, Stephanie, I relate to you 100%. I'm a person who has like, my mom wardrobe and my work wardrobe. I do everything differently. I eat differently when I'm going to work versus when I'm staying home. I, you know, my day is structured entirely different. Like all the rules are different for working from home and, and staying home. And now it's just like one continuous day and you don't even know what the date is. So uh, first I relate to you. Second, just remember this is a pandemic and there is no playbook for a pandemic. Nobody that we know that is alive right now has ever experienced something like this. And so, you know, it's not to say let the severity of this situation sit on you, like weigh on you in a heavy way. It's just to acknowledge the fact that 
these operating times are, are very different and, and have never been seen before. And one of my like core tenants for this time is to just stay human and be as human as you possibly can, uh, both as a leader and as an, an employee. And, um, you know, it's not, I'm, I'm not saying ignore what you're feeling because it is a real feeling. It's just to say like, this is pandemic operating mode and someday we will be through it, but you don't have to hold yourself to the same standards you always do. And someday you'll be back to like, I'm a worker and I'm crushing it and I'm not distracted and I have an amazing outfit on and uh, you'll get to come home and be back in mom mode. But right now it's gonna be a little bit blurry and allowing your teammates, your partners to see that and be exposed to that, I think allows you to show up in a very human way and that's just fine. Okay, one last question for me, then we're gonna turn back to Gina to open it up to some of the other questions. We got an earlier uh, uh, question um, I, I personally felt um, I was an Olympian and, you know, I have all the time in the world, you're focused, you're, you know, same thing in work, you're focused, to your point, you can compartmentalize, um, but you need support system, um, you need to find ways to motivate yourself and get out of bed, um, and, you know, at, at the end of the day, we're all struggling to figure this thing out, so um, question is, um, where do you, where are you turning to for support and motivation um, to, get up in the morning, even though it feels like it's the same day on repeat and, you know, there's so much going on right now, uncertainty, um, anxiety. So I heard Peloton out there. I, I heard a, um, you know, a family, I heard dog walking. Are there any tips, things that, that, that either one of you are, are turning to um, that, that give you that motivation or people that are giving you that support? I know for me, it, I, I'm on video conference like we all are probably from like 8 30 to 5 or 8 30 whatever it is that I actually like don't do as well anymore talking to people I text people like I can't look at people anymore I don't want to look at any screens anymore but like my working mom crew has probably been the most helpful for me because we're all in a very similar bucket and we don't have to explain myself I don't have to say why today was hard I don't have to whatever I can just vent but I'm also tired of venting a little bit. Like I'm tired of complaining about it. So I try to sort of focus on some of like the fun things going on or exciting things or just tell myself, here are the five good things that happened today. But um, I would say, right, I'm lucky to have a supportive husband. Um, I have like a lot of really awesome female working friends. And I think all of us going through this has just been helpful. But for me, it's like text chains. Like I have my like high school friends, my college friends, my abroad friends, and we're all in it together in like mm -hmm. a group so you feel a little more connected as opposed to just one-to-one -one. but Love that's it. me attitude of gratitude and you're writing it down which they've proven when you write it down it has more of an effect on you um and that that network um what about you sarah uh i i i think everybody's looking for a connection and so in business i i have been able to connect with more people that i wanted to talk to from other media companies other organizations um, you know, in the past month and a half than I had in the past year. And that's been interesting because there isn't even an intention. It's just to catch up, see, see, you know, hear what they're seeing, hear how they're responding, um, responding to and talking about what the, what it might look like coming out of this. So that's been really inspiring. Um, I've never felt like I've had enough time to consume all the media that I wanted to. And so right now, one of my favorite things to do is go for a walk and listen to podcasts. Um, and it's just like, it's the combination of being in nature, moving my body and listening to something that's motivating me. Angela, your Bloomberg business in sports is top of that list right now. So I have to get out and listen to you. Um, I meant to before this event, but uh, you know, in some ways that's kind of, I, I, it's been, in, it's been fun to, in, to be re-inspired by the things that inspire me. I haven't had this much time to find little moments of joy like that. Um, and so being reintroduced to new habits has been really great. Uh, that's a great point, Sarah. Um, habit forming, this uh, innovation happens when, you know, time's uh, require it to happen in, in some cases. Um, sometimes leaders are out there doing it, but you're being proactive. You're calling people. You're not looking for anything in particular, just having a, an, an honest conversation. So that's, uh, I'm going to take that one and 
schedule some some meetings maybe I wouldn't have otherwise had. Um, I love that. Um, all right, I'm going to turn it over to Gina because we have a lot of questions that have already come in, pre-populated questions. Um, Sarah, um, Marissa, so far, you guys have been super honest, so I appreciate that. Gina, what's our first question? All right, well, we got a lot of questions sent in advance, so I'm going to start with a few of those. So Sarah, Marissa, we're going to bounce around a little bit, but that's the nature of these AMAs. Um, so we got a lot of questions, uh, Nancy from Tempo, Maya, Julie Lawhorn, a lot of people reached in, uh, reached out to us wanting to hear a little bit about uh, your perspective on getting into the sports industry. And as obviously roles are going to change, what sports looks like when it comes back is going to be totally different. And there's going to be a lot of evolution of the sport and the fan experience, um, more adapting to that fluid fan. So we got a lot of questions on one, do you have any advice for getting into the sports industry? Um, and then two, what are your thoughts on the job market in sports, especially thinking about either entering into sports for the first time as maybe a recent college grad or someone who has always wanted to make that lateral move and start moving into sports and talk about maybe some of the skills, some of the opportunities, some of the networking tactics, um, just some general advice that you might have. Maybe we'll start with you, Sarah, for um, someone interested in getting into this field. Sure. Um, so nobody knows what's going to happen next. Not a single person. And, and I, I even, you know, we're in touch with the major leagues, you know, just about daily at this point. And the, the timelines are shifting, like the dates are shifting. Literally not a human being on the planet knows how things are moving forward in a definitive way. And I think what that means is there's a lot of room to, you know, ideate around what the fan need could be um, and how things could shift. And, uh, you know, to translate that into some of you on the Zoom who are interested in moving into a sports career, I think you should come with some big ideas and some different ways to think about things. We have very established industries um, with set ways of doing things. And a lot of what we've known about the sports ecosystem is, is gonna change. Um, you know, not having fans puts a lot of pressure on technology and media and storytelling. And I mean that in, you know, a, a really fun and challenging kind of way. You know, the, the fan experience as we've known it is about to, sh to shift um, at least for the next year. And so, you know, what, is, what does that mean for reporting? What does that mean for feeling close to an athlete um, or talent? What does that mean for how these brands show up and make sure they're continuing to fuel that passion for their team um, and, you know, really drive interest and engagement? And so I think for everybody at home, like, this is amazing think time. This is a really cool time to be able to read and listen and be inspired and then start to craft your own opinions of what the world might need coming out of this. Yeah, I think we definitely here at the lab, a lot of our clients coming to us um, because they don't know what comes next and they're, they're more open than ever to thinking about how do they bring sports back? How do they connect with that fluid fan? And what are the technologies out there that are gonna help them do that in this new age of sports? So Marissa, can you maybe speak a little, a bit about how, um, if technology, as Sarah mentioned, is becoming more of a differentiator for you from your peers in excelling in your career and um, you know building that media story for the Rams? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a matter of, um, you know, you, I think if, if you use the draft as the example, right, we hosted three live streams with fans over the course of draft weekend, like one with season ticket members on Facebook, and then two um, through a variety of our platforms. But I think it's, you can still connect coaches, players, fans together without, um, without being in person, right? Obviously, we hope to all be in a sold out stadium with fans celebrating that like the reason a lot of us are, like want to work in sports is that like passion and that fire that sports and competition bring you. But um, you know, it's being able to be nimble and like, how do you use this thing that's in our hand in a better way? I mean, iPhone made a whole campaign around shot on the iPhone, right? Like there are things that to Sarah's point, like thinking big, how do we flip 
how do how do we continue to innovate and think about how we can compete in sports, how we connect with fans, how we tell those stories and what stories we tell, right? Like, is it, is it, um, are you in a helmet sport? Are you not a helmet sport? Like how open, how do you connect with these people that are your heroes um, in a way that they want to and fans wanna, um, fans wanna be a part of that right now because a lot of people are going through really different things right now that no one's used to, to Sarah's point. Like we're in a pandemic, this is, there is no playbook for this. Yeah. And we got a question from Lindsay from NASCAR. Um, what has driven your career changes and your moves? And specifically she asked, uh, how do you continue to learn and stay motivated um, and understand your value at that as well? So we had a couple people also ask, um, Danielle, how do you and your key, uh, team make sure you stay on the forefront of evolving tech? So the questions that came in really around, um, where are you looking to move and advance in your career and what's motivating you? Um, and where are you looking for to develop those skill sets and to find that inspiration to help propel you to that next level or that next direction within your own career path? Do you want to go, Sarah? Sure. Um, so I have always just chased projects or raised my hands, my hand for things um, that got me new exposure into something that interested me. It wasn't, uh, I want to be super clear, especially for the recent graduates on this Zoom, like my path wasn't linear. It was not charted. And I, you know, I didn't go to business school. I just kept raising my hand for things that seemed interesting to me. And I tried to work as hard as I possibly could. And I also was, I mean, in order to, I mean, anybody who's played on a team, you know that they're, you have to improve and you have to get better. And so in that way, I try to get over myself a little bit and ask what I was bad at. And I still try to do that and be real about, hey, you weren't, you weren't that great and here's why um or this is how you could have done it better and so allowing allowing that vulnerability uh opened it opened up some pretty direct feedback and that helped me i think it helped me get better um and i i always once i was working in media i was like i'm getting to sports i'm gonna figure out how to get to sports i didn't know how it was gonna happen um, and I'm really happy that it did, but uh, it was really just about raising my hand for things that seemed hard or messy or complicated or might someone might have perceived them to be, you know, too, too junior or too administrative um, and then doing a good job at those things and seeing what they evolved to. Yeah, I mean, I literally wrote down raise your hand, right? Like I've always been someone that says yes and is someone who uh, started in finance. I didn't know what working in sports meant. I really didn't. I was like, well, business school seems like a good idea. Like we're in a financial crisis, like two years down the line, we'll see what happens. I took internships for free with undergrads, right? I had people say like, when I'm your age, I'm never going to be doing this internship. I was like, okay, well, good for you. It works for me. You know, uh, some classmates and I started a conference at Anderson that still exists, which is like how I got my job at Yahoo. And I had the hiring manager at Yahoo tell me, you don't deserve the job. You have no idea what you're getting into with marketing. I was like, let me prove you wrong, right? And then taking the job at the Rams. I ran a marketing team. I'm in media now. Like, as you ask the question, you know, how do you keep learning? Like, you take opportunities that aren't easy for you. Like, I don't know what's next because I'm not great at my job yet. I want to keep getting better at the job I'm doing now and push this organization and myself to like get better at this. But you just keep saying yes to things, but like be scared a little bit. So to follow up on that, um, there was a question that came in from Sophie Cott from Teamworks. A lot of companies have, um, there's layoffs, there's consolidations of teams, departments. So there, on the one hand, you're both saying, put your hand up, which I love. Great advice. What if that's being forced upon you through these layoffs? You have new roles, responsibilities. Have you ever been in that situation, um, a similar situation? And do, do you have any advice on how to approach um, maybe being pushed into a role that you're not completely comfortable in, but is necessary uh, for, the, for the team that you're playing on at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I was at my time at Yahoo, I had five CEOs and went through like a lot of rounds of things. And I think that through every 
big hurdle that I was at there, I just like, again, I said, yes, like, I know that seems really simple, but I was like, I'm in a situation where like, I have a lot of grad school debt. I have this, I want to buy a hat. Like, I'll just learn something new. I literally just was like, whatever you need me to do, like, I'll do it. Cause like to Sarah's point, this is, this pandemic is temporary, but the skills you can learn, like can take you anywhere. You can apply those to anything, right? Like, even if you were no, and I'm not an events person, so maybe this comes across wrong, but like, if you were an events person and now you're taking that skill set and doing virtual and digital things, right? Like you have this like creative imagination for brand experience and building out physical activations. You can take that and do it digitally. It's not the same thing, but then you've like now learned a new skill set. So I think it's like, if you try to tell yourself this isn't forever and that like anytime you can learn a new skill is going to be better for yourself and your brain is like moving and learning, like we're going to come out of this better. Shout out to Shanna McArdle, our events director, who's just doing just that for us. Uh, what about you, Sarah? I'm so sorry. Where did we start with the question? Can you just <laughs> with layoffs, new roles and responsibilities, yeah. like yeah. how do you approach when you're thrust into a job, but whether today or in the future, and you're like, uh oh, I don't know how to do this, but it's required, you know, for the for the you know the success of the team. Sure. Yeah. So first of all, we're actively going through that right now. I mean, I have writers that are writing about mental health and they're like, I've never written about mental health. And we're like, what do you think the world needs now? Um, I have writers writing about parenting and they're like, I never thought I'd share this story. I'm like, well, make it compelling. You know, so I feel like we're bending and shifting real time. Um, I know it can be hard to find yourself doing something that you might want to do, but uh, I think the interesting thing is you, when you're asked to do something, try to connect it to the business plan. Like try to connect it to the why of, of why a company might be asking you to do that thing. Um, you know, there's a big effort and initiative right now uh, across our company to think about subscription services and products. And so I, you know, I like creating content and I like um, continuing to motivate our team to do that. I don't like telling them to pull back on doing things or to, you know, you know, possibly figure out what gets ad supported and what gets behind a paywall, but the justification is there. Um, you know, we aren't seeing ad dollars flow like crazy in Q2. And so, you know, there is a business need and a justification. And I think when you can put it in the context of a business need, it gives you a greater sense of purpose. That's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, we got a lot of we got a lot of questions around that. So I think um, we'll want to continue the conversation around that as well. Um, jumping around a little bit, we got several questions and a couple are coming in around navigating your career and um, you know your role as a minority gender in the industry. So um, one question we just got in the chat from Julie. Uh, in the very visible positions you are in, have any of you ever experienced imposter syndrome in the sports industry? And Rachel also asked, um, there's a lot of collaboration that's required in the sports industries and probably you're, um, you know, potentially one female amongst a lot of men. So um, how do you think about navigating in an industry with a lot of uh, collaboration when you may feel like a minority? Have you ever felt kind of that imposter syndrome and, and what helps you kind of keep your head high um, and, and push through? So, right. yes. Okay, Sarah, take it. Sorry. <laughs> All the time. Um, and I've talked to Marissa about this a lot. Um, I have tried to make it a source of great empowerment and to say, I'm here so that other people can be too. It doesn't mean it's not hard. It doesn't mean I don't sometimes want to go home and cry. Um, it just means that in the moment, I'm not willing to give in. And I'll give a very real, like, ta you know, tangible experience. I, when I had my third daughter or my third child, a little girl, um, I had her last December, so December of 2018. And coming back to work was the single hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Like, it was brutal. I was tired, fueled by caffeine. I mean, many things you all have gone through as well. And the greatest source of motivation for me was that this is when the women quit. 
this, that moment is what, like the world didn't want me to win. And I tried to make that my motivation to keep going um, and to fight through it because it was so hard. Um, and I, I mean, honest, I give so much respect to Marissa because she travels to every single Rams game and had a baby at the same time. And I'm like, I mean, even thinking about that, it, it's just so overwhelming coming back and fighting through it. And so um, I will tell this to this group of women and it's okay if it goes on Facebook and men watch it too. But when I'm in the room, I'm like, this is a source of empowerment and I'm doing it for the next, the, the women that are behind me. Um, and that becomes a great motivator. Yeah, I mean, I think yes. I, she said it so well. Um, I've always had a voice. I know my mom's on this call, so I'll give her a shout out. But like, she just taught me to like, I mean, maybe too, maybe I have too much of a voice at this point, but like, I, I am really, um, uh, like I'm not a passive person, right? So female, male, like I'm gonna say it how it is. I'm gonna like have a conversation with you. I'm not the most eloquent person at the table. Cause like, I would be, I would be a terrible poker player, right? Like if I'm happy, you know it. If I'm sad, you know it. And I don't like apologize for that. Like I, that's part of the reason why I think I've been successful is that like I you get who you get with me and so like yes coming back pumping on the 405 to the 101 like sucked right like it sucked like you're spilling milk in the car you like can't put your shirt on until you get to work like I was 36 weeks pregnant at the Super Bowl but like I wasn't missing that like I wasn't gonna let that stop me but I also like wasn't scared to say like hey I need to sit down right and I think it was really challenging starting a job at the Rams, not feeling like I knew exactly what I was doing with this job and three months later being like, I'm pregnant, right? I tried to time it with the off season and like got lucky, but that means I started a new job, didn't really know what I was doing and I was pregnant. I was like, I just have to just like keep going. And to Sarah's point, like it was really hard, but like I needed to show and prove that like other people can do this too. And like, it's okay. It's like someone at Yahoo told me once when you're in that phase of having kids, like be okay with staying in the game. Like just stay in the game. It's okay if you're not like striving for the next big thing, the next big thing, the next big thing, but like stay in the game. Like it will pay off dividends once they like can wipe their own butt and like go to school and like do those sorts of things. And like, it was very challenging to take a new job in that period of life, but I don't regret it at all. And I'm like very grateful for like the place I work and the people I work with for like allowing that to be okay. Angela, yeah. I'd love you to weigh in on this. I'm like, I just want to stand up and be like, yes, <laughs> I love both those answers. Um, that is exactly, I think, why we have this is everyone's experienced this. Um, my, my hockey career, when I was nine, I was cut from a boys team because I was a girl. My brother made the team. I didn't simply because I was a girl. And it was the defining moment of my career. It really helped me. I did exactly what Sarah said. I'm like, oh, oh yeah, like, I'll show you. And that's what gave me intent and purpose and like yes I loved hockey and all those things but I had like I wasn't just going through the motions I had a very focused effort every time I stepped on the ice and I think that's exactly um to to both your points in in in, in our careers you should expect to get cut you should expect to get you know sidelined or maybe not given the first look we, we hire people that look like ourselves I mean that's they're, they're, we're in the sports industry. We're in the tech industry. We're talking about that. The, the, the sports industry, entertainment industry um, is male dominated. So I think part of this is like, you should expect. And so that's why I love the response that, that, that both of you had on this, um, which is like, it's how you respond to it um, and why we have to stick together. I would love for, you know, Wise is already doing this, but if you're going to do business, pick up the phone with another woman because guys do it all the time. <laughs> Um, so anyway, I won't get on that, but my four medals, I really trace back to that uh, moment when I was nine getting cut and really saying I can, I can quit or I can prove everyone wrong. So, um, love, and you love know, that. that coach was watching you take the podium to accept those medals. Oh so. yeah. I actually gave him a shout out on my book saying, thank you for cutting me. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Angela, awesome. you can absolutely get on that bandwagon of doing business with women. Let's talk about this, Absolutely. Kathleen, because I'm adamant that, you know, again, you're, you heard, you have two women on this call right now that are, that are sharing secrets, how they're dealing with it. Um, if you're looking to, if you're a brand looking to support a property, okay, you have someone that's working in this fence. You know, if you have 
uh, if you're looking for a new platform, obviously Yahoo, but it's, to me, it's all about the old boys club. Like this should be the old girls club. We should uh, support one another. So whatever we call it, um, I'm happy we're doing this. And that's actually an awesome trans transition. We got a few minutes left. So I want to hit a couple uh, more quick questions. Um, talking about what comes next. Um, as we start to ease into the new normal, um, Carrie asked, how do you feel about pitching new business during this time or being pitched new business during this time? Um, you know, as an agent, she's trying to generate relationships without being callous. So are you open to hearing, piss, uh, opening to hearing new pitches? H how are you feeling about generating business at this time? Uh, Marissa, you want to go? Do you think? Sure. I mean, Right, we, we're we're opening SoFi Stadium, right? Like we have a lot of new partners coming in, and 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 our and our you know sales team is working really hard. I think that one of the things that we're talking a lot about is like cause related programs, and all of the work our like fabulous community team does in the community, and how do we bring partner? How do we pair partners with what what the Rams are already doing, or how do we continue to uh, you know elevate and amplify that? So I think that's, that is a, um, something we've always been proud of, but now where partners kind of want to come and be attached to that. So I think that's a big thing to think about is like, how do we acknowledge the time we're in? How do we amplify and bring attention to the kind of organizations and the groups of people that, that need it more than, more than some? Um, and so I think that's a big place where, where we are focusing um, in terms of what you would think about like dollars and attention. And then I think it's like being nimble, right? Like, what we may have done a big NFL draft activation, like physical somewhere, like a big party, we're not doing that anymore, right? So shifting business to thinking about more digital platforms, more social series, more social content. Um, so I think it's a matter of like shifting focus to where people are, but also like being cognizant of, of what's happening to communities and people all around us. That's awesome. And Sarah, are you, you know, what's some of the advice, um, you know, you're giving to your team that might be trying to sell sponsorships um, during this time? I think we've spent a ton of time uh, just looking at, hey, what categories make sense to, to you know, be still spending money and, and where should we be a bit more sensitive? Um, I think, you know, for, for sponsorships, for brands, for agencies, no matter who you are, making sure that you come to the table as a problem solver um, and less so as a, you know, as a one dimensional needs person. So, you know, to the point with, with the agency question, I'll talk to any agent that is willing to come and listen and then help me solve a problem I'm trying to solve rather than push a roster that they're trying to place. Any, anyone who does that, good. Um, same thing for us with, with, you know, pitching our NFL product suite right now um yahoo fantasy we're trying to come to the table with uh very connected pitches for how brands specifically can work with us to deliver specific messages um there's a renewal that we're working on right now with an insurance company and uh, they have a very targeted demo and a very targeted audience so any idea that we're coming to them with is grounded in research and insight and a lot of thought for how we'll carefully handle their brand. And so I think it's a great time to come in a thoughtful way um, where you're collectively solving problems and not you know, making your intention and your sole goal um, the driving force be behind the conversation. Which should be a good lesson for you know, anyone selling all the time, um, but I think it's especially relevant right now. And I love Marissa. Um, the thought of adding some social good. I think brands in kind of the traditional CPG brand world have really adopted that. And they're very good at integrating the BOGO and the social good. Um, but I think the sports world has been slower to adopt that. So this could be a, a positive force of change um, in that way. And so kind of one more question and wrap up. We always like to wrap up with letting our guests kind of um, give any final thoughts, but we got a couple questions um, on what do you think it's going to look like when we get back in terms of potential new norms for the work environment? So not necessarily the industry, but you as a woman, as a team member, as someone coming out of working from home, going back into the office, um, Lauren from the Pepsi Sports Center wanted to know if your own expectations for your role or your team's or your staff's role, how they might change or evolve or how you might pull things that were actually 
positive from this experience and bring that into you know the future um, for your work environment and and any other kind of final thoughts on what the future might hold before we wrap up I mean I think we don't know right so this is sort of like speculation at this point there are no federal or state guidelines as far as I'm aware as to like returning to work and those things so I think it's a matter of being really sensitive to people's feelings about all of this and so you know we're having lots of conversations about when what when, when the office opens back up like who goes do you stagger days do you stagger start times what kind of protocols do you put in place do you wear masks are you taking temperatures how often are cleaning um, services coming, um, you know, certain job functions need to be in the office to like be more efficient and some don't. And so like, is that something, right? It doesn't mean that if your job function doesn't require you to be in the office, you're any more or less important. It just means that if you don't need to be there, then right now at this time, maybe you don't, you don't need to be there. Right. And so, and being okay with that. And I think it's, I really want companies, you know, and I, we, we've been talking about this to be proactive in messaging that, right? And be proactive in explaining that, that it's going to be a really weird time. And so to be vocal, to have those conversations, like managers have conversations with their staff about that. Um, you know, my team really, there are people who don't want to come back and offer people that do, but it's easier to edit, right? Like edit bays and those things like being done at home and on home Wi-Fi is really challenging. Um, and I think that we sort of, we hit on this before, but like being nimble, and and being willing to if there is if your job function isn't necessarily as busy raising your hand don't wait to get asked just say like hey can i help out with something else can i do something else and um i think it's i think there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and i think we you know i always talk about being okay and change and ambiguity and that's going to test all of us a lot i would say over the next six months to a year and um and talk like and I'm someone that will always raise my hand and ask a question or say my point of view, but I think I you know, encourage people to do that because unless you use your voice, we won't know if there's an issue or a problem or a great a big idea to Sarah's point, like the world is changing and being open to new ideas. Um, I don't know if I answered your question, but kind of went on a rant there. No, absolutely. And, and we're just hitting two o'clock. Um, we know we're going to lose a lot of people. So Angela is going to uh, take us home. We're posting our Slack links. Um, we'll also have the AMA video up on wiseworks.org and the Sports Innovation Lab AMA page. Um, and on Thursday, we have Val Ackerman, uh, the commissioner of the Big East Conference. So we're continuing with the female empowerment theme this week. So um, Sarah, Marissa, thank you so much. Angela, would love to hear kind of your final thoughts um, on kind of what comes next and looking towards the future as we wrap this up. Well, we're trying to predict the future. We don't have it. That's all we do every day. <laughs> study the future sports but to the broader question um what doesn't kill you makes you stronger you learn more about yourself in hardship when things are tough than when you get the gold medal when you successfully win when you're you're on autopilot so sarah and marissa's your your insights have been super helpful um so many great tips uh, and recommendations i hope everyone takes from this uh brief conversation something that they can use in this uh turbulent time and uh, to Kathleen's point, thank you for what you do for bringing the community together. Uh, women have to stick together. We as a society have to stick together. So um, I'm really happy I could be a part of this. Wanna thank you, Gina and the rest of my team. Um, but, um, but stay strong at the end of the day. And I think in when, whenever we come out of this, um, we're all gonna be better people and hopefully a society because of it. So thanks again for being a part of this. I, I really appreciate it. Um, and I am, Make sure you follow Marissa and Sarah and, and tweet at them and follow them and, and support them at the end of the day. Yeah, we'll send an email to everyone with the video of today's session with some links to WISE, with Sarah and Marissa's social handles, um, and you know how you continue to join this AMA series with the Sports Innovation Lab. So thanks, everyone. Stay safe and be well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.